Joanne, I should have given you the microphone. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hi, Christine. Uh, how, how many of you know where Nicaragua is? Nicaragua. How many of you know where Nicaragua is? They don't in Nicaragua, huh? It's in Central America, just south of Mexico, just north of Panama. As a matter of fact, the first canal was going to be... Hi there. The, do I know you? You look real familiar. Um, the first canal was going to be built through Nicaragua instead of Panama because it would have been an easier construction. Um, and so the United States began to try to um, gain better control over Nicaragua because they needed to have the, the canal place. And in case Panama, after the canal was built, in case Panama ever said you cannot use the Panama Canal anymore, the United States need to have a relationship with Nicaragua to keep that going. So we have a very strong history, the United States, with Nicaragua, positive and negative, invasive and friendly. But we, so we have a real hot and cold, friendly, unfriendly relationship with Nicaragua. Sometimes they call us friends. Sometimes they say we're from the United Snakes of America. But, but what we have, what Julie and I have, are really good friends in Mutaflor, Nicaragua. Mutaflor, Nicaragua is northwest of Managua, almost to Honduras, which on the north side. Um, it's a remote, mountainous, very rural community, no running water, no electricity. And in um, winter of 98, 99, it was almost blown away by Hurricane Mitch. I mean, families and villages just washed down steep mountainsides. That's when I began working with this community in January 1999 for health brigades. Um, and we, d we did crisis intervention. I sat down and talked with the community leaders after our second trip in March and said, you know, you folks are well organized. You just don't have many resources because Nicaragua is such a poor country. I think the university could be a gold mine for you. So you come up with some proposals for how we can work together because everything has to be based on their expressed needs, their expressed desires, not what we think they need because we're working on a partnership. They came up with some proposals and we're getting all these projects out of it, health projects, and this last project was when Julia went with me in May, we had uh, engineering, English, business, um, women and gender studies, and nursing, and, we're rep and biology is going down, and physician assistant programs. We're all going down together to work with this community on connected projects that had been requested by the community. But as Julie and I reflected about our trip, we began reflecting about what keeps drawing us there? Why do we keep wanting to go back? Why does Nicaragua get into our blood? And part of it is because we connect with the women of Nicaragua. We asked ourselves, what do we have in common? Take this microphone anytime, Julia. You want to go first? Sure. Well, and I can and just talk for a brief minute about how I sort of got in, into the project. So Gail has a long established partnership. She's been working with these folks for a really long time. And so part of what got me excited was hearing how excited Gail was about this project and this community. Women and gender studies on our campus needed to expand its opportunities for studies abroad. There weren't a lot of programs specifically designed for students who are interested in women and gender studies. And so Gayla said, we've been doing health projects, but we're also interested in, in working with the community and thinking about what the community needs and what, what we can bring to the community. So I have a particular set of skills and interests and research areas. In particular, my research areas are interested in women's health, women's health focus. My dissertation is about women's experiences with breast cancer. So when we got down there, when we started meeting with folks, it, to me, it sort of pulled together lots of things that are interesting and important in my life. A lot of times in my classes, I give students the opportunity to service learning projects because I think it's really important to incorporate both doing community service with an academic component or as a feminist we sort of talk about combining the theory and practice of doing our feminism so for me it was important to sort of think about that and when we went to this community to sort of sit down with the women I think that was the most important part of our visit for me we had a meeting where we, we got into this room with the women although some men snuck in even though we had sort of requested we wanted uh, to sort of for the dynamics of, of the meeting to sort of sit down and hear what the women had to say and so sort of making those connections and thinking about, about what how we can develop a partnership so if you look at these pictures, when you see more of the pictures about the community, there, there are a lot of needs in this community, and I'm sure Gayla will talk a little bit more about that. But she, she's mentioned specifically how can we tap into the resources that the university and the folks on the interdisciplinary program, the interdisciplinary committee have. So we have, she mentioned that we have folks who are interested in business, so can we think about economic development? We have folks in engineering, so can we think about sustainable engineering projects? And so how can we bring all that stuff together in a way that really supports the community needs? And then doesn't, it's not driven by us. So, you know, there's research that I need to do. There are things that I need to do for my career or for, you know, what, what needs to happen over here in West Michigan. But 
but that's not as important when we get down there. If, you know, if, if I had a, a really great idea for a project, but it wasn't something that was helpful to them, then we will reframe the project. So. All right, so we began looking at why do we identify with these women, just as one base of this project. When you look at this slide and you look at the question, give me an answer to that question. What do you think, based on this slide, what do we have in common? Family, we have family. What else do you see that we have in common? Look at the picture, look at the next one. What do we have in common? Chores, yes. Who doesn't have to wash their clothes, right? Now when they wash their clothes, they wash them on rocks. When we wash our clothes, we put them in a machine and turn a switch. I'll tell you what, when I bring my clothes back from Nicaragua, there are stains that have been in there for years that they got out. And it's because they use a natural method of combining the pith from orange, that white stuff on right under the skin. You combine that with salt, rub it into the clothes, bink, stain gone. So, so you, you, right at your home, you can remove your own stains. So we have chores in common. You know who that is. <clears throat> you don't recognize me when I'm in Nicaragua. I look entirely different. And I'm usually on horseback or squatting down in front of somebody's boo-boo on their belly or something. But how do we identify with them? First of all, we have to go there. We have to go. You cannot identify with somebody very easily when you're a distance. You need to go. You need to live the way that they live. You need to eat what they eat. You need to scratch the same flea bites they're scratching. You need to use the same latrine they're using or squat by the path. You need, <laughs> she's been to Nicaragua, you need to experience what they've experienced because then you get over this idea of how we're so different. I mean, you st and you start thinking about, wow, what do we have in common? identify story. So I come from Boston and everybody in my family is a really big Red Sox fan. So it was really funny to me. So we get to Nicaragua and our host at the, the house that we're staying has a, a Red Sox hat on. So I start talking to him in my limited Spanish. I don't have very strong Spanish. But we were able to talk about baseball and sort of that was sort of interesting to me that we were sort of able to connect and in fact he had been listening to the Red Sox game so he came out and gave me this update on what the Red Sox had been doing on that particular day and I said oh good my dad was worried when I was in Nicaragua that I might not be able to keep in touch with what was going on with the Red Sox so this idea of sort of identifying about something that you know it, it wasn't something I thought before I went to Nicaragua that we would sort of build this connection about something in that way. There are always connections. How do we identify with this woman? Sitting in this room, how do you identify with this woman? What do you see? When you look at this picture, the first thing you see is poverty, right? Oh my goodness, it's so different. That's her home behind her. It has two rooms in it. How do you identify with her? Any of you have any ideas? Not at all. She's holding an infant. Yeah. We get so caught up in seeing differences, we forget to see similarities. We forget to see. How are we women of the world? We are all women of the world. You know, the six degrees of separation? You're related to everybody in some way. If you look back here, she's a young woman with a child. If you look here, this is grandma. Should I tell them what she said to me? Yeah. <laughs> This woman does not speak any English, except when she came in, I was treating her for some parasites and for some, an, an ulcer on her lower ankle. And through the interpreter, because I couldn't understand her Spanish, because she has no teeth, and that really makes it difficult to understand pe people's diction, she said through the interpreter, I can speak English. I said, here you are making me struggle with my Spanish, and you can speak English, and she smiled. And I said, what can you say? And she said, oh, I, I shouldn't say it to you. She's saying this in Spanish, right? And I said, come on, tell me. I've been struggling with, struggling with my Spanish. You struggle with your English. Tell me. And she looked at me and she said, you goddamn son of a bitch. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I said, where, where? She said, I learned that from a U.S. soldier. <laughs> so we have in common that we're called bitch, right? Which, as according to Patricia Ireland, B-I-T-C-H, stands for being in total control, honey. So when somebody calls you a bitch, you say, thank you for acknowledging my power, and you keep right on going. That, okay, <laughs> remember that. That's an important one, B-I-T-C-H. Okay, what differences intrigue us and challenge us? So I think you're going to be more adept at seeing differences and similarities. What differences do you see? Methods of cooking. You can see the wood. They went out and they gathered wood. They're gathering only dead wood. They do not cut down live trees because they live in a natural reserve. 
they have an incredible respect for their mountain. They know if they destroy their mountain, they destroy their life. What else do you see? What differences intrigue us and challenge us? Where are you going to wash your hands in this kitchen? Where are you going to wash your hands? Where are you going to put the garbage? There's usually a cat sitting up, up on the, up on the um, table, and there's often a pig waiting right down near her foot to gather some garbage. Do you know what they're doing here? Do you know how much work it takes to make a tortilla? Oh, my goodness. They grow the corn. They pick the corn. They dry the corn. This corn is dried. They're pushing the corn off the husk. They soak the dry corn overnight in water. Then the next morning, they put it through a grinder. And I'll show you a little bit later. Then they have to roll it between rocks to make it even finer. And then they add some water to it. And then they pat it into tortillas. And then they cook it. It's a long process to make a tortilla. And there's a tortilla that they've made. OK, I'm going to ask you this. You want to go with this question. What similarities? So what similarities intrigue and challenge us? So what do you all think about in terms of, so you came here today because you wanted to hear a little bit, perhaps, about what we had to say about our, our trip to Nicaragua. Or maybe you came here because you wanted to get that V sticker or <laughs> other <laughs> reasons why you came. But so what things about that description, when you read the description, intrigued or challenged you when you were sort of thinking about whether or not you were going to spend some time to come and, and listen with us in this hour that we have together? What kinds of things intrigued you about that little description? So some folks were interested in Nicaragua, perhaps, right? <laughs> what other things? Yeah. OK, so thinking about the, the kinds of problems that they have, which would be what? Ab Definitely. Um, gender empowerment is one of the areas that I am very much interested in and sort of thinking about. So when we talk about working from a patriarchal culture, how do we sort of, when we, when we go and when we work with folks, how can we model being both strong women? I had a sort of a, a, a challenge. We were at this meeting, and they set the coffee down in front of me. And I, I thought for a minute, I don't want to pour this coffee. I don't want to be the woman who pours the coffee. But then I thought, well, I'm in their house, and I'm the closest to the coffee. So should I pour the coffee? You know, OK, you know, I'll, I'll pour the coffee because it's sitting in front of me. But sort of that challenge of sort of how do we, how do we sort of gently encourage gender empowerment while recognizing and being respectful of their culture, I think is really important to sort of think about what it is we're doing. And, and so there are, there are great role models for women there. there really strong women that are doing some really great work. They have, you know, there's a, a long history of Nicaraguan feminists and women who are involved in the revolution. So there's definitely good models there, but to sort of think about how do we, how do we encourage the women to sort of follow those models in a way that's not sort of coming in and saying, you know, well, we're women from the U.S. and we're so free and we're so empowered and everything's great for us. So I think that's a really good connection to think about how, how we sort of work towards gender empowerment everywhere. What other similarities intrigue and challenge us? If you just see a woman standing there at the table, what, what do you think that she has the similarity with you? Look at her. What similarity? There's nothing dumb to be said in this room. It's OK to say. She has a clip in her hair. You put clips in your hair? Mm -hmm. What other similarities do you see? Anything? Shorts and t-shirt, yes. She's cooking. She's not emaciated. She's healthy looking. Yeah. Similarities, dealing with young men and men. We just mentioned that. It is a very machismo culture. However, um, there will be an article printed in um, Journal of Transcultural Nursing uh, pretty soon that is um, a write-up of a qualitative research study that I and four other people did, interviewing women who had worked with the brigades to, say, to see how they felt changed, because we could see some changes happening. And their comment to us was, we still need to respect the way things are. We need to respect community. But um, Gayla, we saw you um, tell this man to stop interrupting you and listen to your words. And we figured, man, if you can do that, we can do that. And so what we have in common is that we hold a love and, and concern for families, right? These children rode this horse for about an hour and a half with a written note from their mother because she was too sick to come to the clinic. 
and her symptoms were described on a piece of paper and we sent home some vitamins and aspirin for her and treated the kids for parasite and, um, and then this kid, the kid on the left, um, fell off the horses they were leaving so we stitched up his head and then we sent him back. We hold love and concern for children. The children just creep into your heart. They just creep into your heart. Because uh, uh, when you see a child who's hungry, a child who's happy, a child who gives you a hug, you know, or a child who needs loving, um, the, ch the little girl with a white pocket on her shirt, um, her mother um, was Maria. Uh, Maria died of cervical cancer at age 32. Cervical cancer is the number one killer of women in Central America. We have a 97% survival rate from cervical cancer here. There, it's the number one killer. When I found out she died, I said, what's going to happen to her three children? And they said, they're taken care of. Because what we don't have in common quite so much is a strong sense of community. When people knew she was dying, the children were immediately absorbed into the community. There was no question about it. They weren't sent away. They were absorbed into the community. That's really where a village raises the child. We hold love and concern for community. Now, this is really us playing baseball <laughs> against some of the local guys. None of the women would play baseball because they don't play baseball. First base really was a cow patty. So you didn't want to slide into first base <laughs> by any stretch. We had to call the game at one point because the pigs were running across the backfield. And then when the bull charged us, we all ran. But, but then the bull was gone, so we went back to playing the game. We hold love and concern for health. We want our families, we want ourselves, we want our children to be healthy. We have found that one of the best things we can do, and this is by their request also, is to simply take vitamins. Vitamins, even more than antibiotics, are one of the best things we can take down there. The government says they distribute vitamin A because vitamin A deficiency causes your immune system to be weak. They say they distribute it. I have never seen it in the six years I've been up there. That's one of my students. I just love that picture. Yeah? program too that might help well and so in sort of thinking about addressing these these arenas Kayla and I have been working this year and Kayla's heading off to Nicaragua again tomorrow actually to develop a reading exchange program and so one of the things that we were uh, the hope with the reading exchange program is to sort of develop culturally sensitive curricula for the schools for the, the teachers to use to, to, to get the materials themselves to write a curriculum that would be appropriate when Gail was talking about washing your hands. So where do you wash your hands? So we didn't necessarily want to bring in books that talked about hand washing using a lot of hot running water and paper towels if that's not the appropriate technology for, for the, the, those locations. So thinking about how to, to sort of promote health in those ways. And so in developing this program, Gail is going to be talking with the teachers and sort of thinking about how do we, how do we design a curriculum that, that advances these these areas in, a, in some of the ways that you're talking about. So bringing the, the community stakeholders together, bringing the parents together, and sort of working out from there is, is an important part of this. And so it, it has both a health component and then also hopefully a literacy component because there will be books and, and they'll also be crossing borders. We're going to be uh, working also with children in West Michigan, so hopefully building that, working on those connections as well. We're talking about you know, needing to see that connection between other folks and developing international friendships. And to f go further with your question, the Reading Exchange Program has come about by request from the community. Julia is a teacher in Lapita, uh, it's one of the three schools, and she and the mothers in that community said, we see our children's health improving with the health brigades coming back every six months. They're getting their vitamins. We see our kids washing their hands or their feet better because if they don't wash their feet, the gringas wash their feet to look at them when they come and it's embarrassing to have their feet washed in front of everybody. So they're washing more. And they decided, they asked if they could formalize it into a school curriculum because it, the mothers are working hard, just like the fathers are. It's hard, they have very, dis, very definite roles, but because, it's because work is hard. It takes half a day to wash clothes. It takes half a day to go out and machete down a field, and somebody has to be assigned to do something. But the Reading Exchange Program is because they asked for it, and they are going to help develop the curriculum. And the connection piece that Julia talked about is the kids there will make tapes and pictures and read books and send them up here to kids in classrooms up here who will look at those same books and tapes and stuff 
And then the kids here are going to read books and make pictures and send them down there, and they're going to make friends. So when they look at a picture, they don't see how we're different. They see my friend. We need to see more friends when we look across the world as opposed to seeing differences in enemies. Doyle is a feminist writer who talks about what women have in common. And she talks about that we have bodily experiences in common. Not one of you mentioned that. You saw a woman standing in a kitchen. Don't you think she menstruates? Don't we have that? Have we not all experienced some kind of a, a menstrual cramp? We have that in common. Do all of us have a fear of conceiving when we don't want to conceive? Or not conceiving if we do want to conceive? Do we not all have some kind of, if, if we choose to be pregnant and choose to bear a child, don't we all have a little anticipatory anxiety about how am I going to push that watermelon out through that little, little canal, you know? I mean, yeah, we all, we all have that, that concern. So we have bodily experiences. We have the need for safety in common. We have the need for physical health, mental health, and we share bodily experiences. We share compassion. This little girl's mother is a street vendor, and, that's, and she sells pop and her little one just fell asleep on, on that. We share connection. W women's brains work differently than men's brains. Not better, not less than, just somewhat differently. And women tend to think in terms of networking and connections, and men tend to think A, B, C, D. This became evident when I read some research about why women sur tend to survive strokes better than men do. You know, if, so if, if you're going to have a stroke, it's better to be, to be a woman than a man, because you'll survive it better. The reason is that they gave a man a task to do, and they had an EEG to measure brain waves. And when the man had, when they checked his EEG, when he was doing this task, a brain center whoop, lit up because he's working on this task. They gave a woman the exact same task to do, put the same EEG on her. She's working on the task, and about five brain centers lighted up because women connect with so many other things. More than men tend to be very directed, stereotypically speaking, okay? And I happen to live with an engineer, so it works, you know. A plus B plus A equals C, you know. Um, but uh, but so, so if a man has a stroke and he loses that part of his, of his brain where he can do that task, he loses the ability to do that task. If the woman has a stroke of the same part of the brain, she can compensate because she had networked to other brain centers. We think in terms of connection. Women th tend to think in terms of connection. Connection for a minute. So one of the, the, the things that I think that this communi community can help us to focus on is, so I teach this course called Women, Health, and the Environment. And in that course, we spend a lot of time sort of thinking about where our food comes from and, and how you know, organic food is better. And so this community has made a commitment. They're growing organic coffee. And one of the byproducts of that, they've noticed that the orchids from the, the, the are, are coming back. And so the, these orchids are just incredibly beautiful. And so they showed us some of the orchids. They took us around and showed us how the coffee was being grown. And so it's not only organic, but it's shade grown because that's better. It's better for the world. It's better for the environment. It's better for the, the folks that are living there. So thinking about what they're doing to sort of model a, a sort of a more in tune kind of a life and thinking about this connection between moving away from pesticides and how moving away from pesticides, they can see that the orchids are a visible marker that what they're doing is better for their environment. They live in this midiflora is, is most of midiflora is a biological reserve, which means it's sort of been recognized when Gail was talking about gathering the wood, so not cutting down the trees. There are certain rules about how we take care of the environment, how we connect to the environment. And so I think that that connection both between humans and then between sort of the world around us is an important lesson. You know, some folks might have thought, oh, well, you know, we're just going to go down there and bring all this medicine to them, and we're not going to get anything back from it. You know, it's going to be just going one way. But it's really important to think about this, the lessons that we can learn about sort of those bigger connections. And if we don't take care of the environment, there's no point to the rest of it. We only have one planet. If we don't take care of this one, we're going to be in trouble. You know, at least, I think one of the speakers for Sustainability Day was saying, at least humans are going to be in trouble. She was saying that maybe the cockroaches might survive, but, but humans weren't going to if we kept ruining our environment. So thinking about those connections is really important to me as well. So we share compassion, we share connection, and we share a sense of continuity. You cannot have a sense of continuity without the connection first. You connect the dots, and then you continue, the, continue on down the road. And I want to follow up on what you said about the, the, the health brigades. The, the, the reason that we are continuing this project with Nicaragua is because I believe in continuity. As I go through websites and talk to other NGOs, nonprofit organizations, or talk to other people who have traveled to do good work in another country, they tend to make one or two trips. 
and they come back and they've, they've had a, it's been a great experience. And they said, oh man, I did this and I did that and I did this. Well, and and that, then health brigades are often done that way. An organization will go down and do a one-time health brigade. I call them band-aid brigades. Because you go down, you put a band-aid on, you kiss the boo-boo, you say it's all better, you walk away and you come back and you do shows about it and you feel so good and so altruistic and the band-aid falls off and you don't even know it fell off. So I will, I will not participate in band-aid brigades we, because we have compassion, because we have to be connected, and because there has to be a sense of continuity. You have to build a partnership, an equal partnership. The people with us in Nicaragua are working as partners. That their educational level doesn't matter. They're the experts. They're the experts for their community. We need to go to them and ask them what they want. They want us to continue to work with health care, but we, will bring, we are and we have since uh, 2003 brought in the local medical school and the local school of nursing to work with us to promote connection and continuity. So we have compassion, connection, and continuity. That's Raphael on the far end, Maribel. One of my old students, I, don't, I, I can remember everybody's name but my old student's name. Uh, should I do the last slide? <laughs> Sorry. We also compare. We, we connect very natural. Oh, not this one. That's one of my favorite pictures. We share naturally. It just comes natural to women to share. I know we wanted to talk a little bit, too, about what you all, how you all can get involved if you're sort of interested in, in so all of these projects are ongoing projects. I'll let Gayla talk a little bit more about the the Nicaragua projects and, and sort of thinking about so but there's going to be we've done we did a collection last time before we went through the Women's Center and we're going to do that again coming up in before the trips in the spring so we'll, we'll get the word out about that there'll be a list of sort of things that folks are, are we're looking for for that that portion of sort of bringing the vitamins and, and bringing the, the medicine but for the reading exchange we also are going to need collections of just basic school supplies. They're, they're, they're sadly lacking in terms of some of the basic school supplies to be used. We're going to be looking at sort of getting books together and so sort of thinking about those elements. And then hopefully some of you will get it excited enough that you want to come with us in terms of doing research and, and study abroad programs down there. So I'll let Gayla talk a little bit about sort of where th some of that stuff is going. Okay. Good. If you attended the convocation at the beginning of this year, the president commented to incoming students that he thinks that study abroad is one of the most important things students should do. One of the most important. And it's very important to step outside of Grand Rapids, to step outside of West Michigan, and put yourself in a place where nothing looks familiar. Nothing sounds familiar. Nothing smells familiar. And then you have to do something. You have to do something with integrity and something with honor. And you can't even talk to the person next to you to figure out what to do. You need to have that experience. My, my philosophy of education, but what I believe is the purpose of education, the purpose of education is to make the comfortable uncomfortable. Because then you have to find a way to get comfortable again. So study abroad is one way to make yourself uncomfortable in a learning kind of environment. Through the Nicaragua Project is an interdisciplinary program, and we are developing some courses for summer programs that will be available probably in two summers from now, most, uh, 07. In the meantime, you can do any kind of independent study that you can imagine. You can, you can register for independent credits with particular faculty who are willing to work with this. You register with me. I, I, my belief is if there's not a system in place to do something, Let's walk around that system and find another way to do it. I'm not a very good rule follower. Ask my dean. So if any of you are interested in traveling to Nicaragua, Julie and I can sit down and talk with you or somebody from the, from the international office and say, what do you wish for? How big is your imagination? The only limit to international study is created by the limits of your imagination. And I believe in stretching it. If you want to go and have experiences that are unforgettable. And to know that you're having experiences as part of a long-term project that is respectful of and sensitive to the community, then you want to become involved in the Nicaragua Project. Now, we've done so much talking. And it's getting warm in here. Am I having a hot flash? I'm not sure what, but what questions do you have? 
you were commenting on feminism, and I've I traveled to Nicaragua with a study abroad program, so I've done a lot of this. And but I was in a much more urban setting. I was in Managua and uh, Santa Marta. Um, although I did spend some time in Matagalpa, which was an incredibly interesting experience. Um, but that was only two days in very rural and like the conditions in which you're talking about. Um, but I've gone on in my grad school to look at the interrelationships between nonprofits and government and how that's affecting um, these experiences and what you're doing. And what what have you run into as far as the U.S. government or Nicaraguan government um, in trying to pursue some of these things? Uh, I mean, there's a long history of, you were saying that there's a long history of feminism, but there's also a long history of those same feminists <laughs> being, um, you know, taken, you know, they were, yeah, exactly. What I think is the biggest challenge is when interest groups or nonprofits do one-shot experiences. When we were looking at that one website about an, an education program that was done, I don't want to name that nonprofit, um, and they, it was a really great education program that they did in Nicaragua, and we, went, we thought, oh my golly, we want to work with this NGO, this non-governmental organization, because they did this great project, and it's up on their website, right on the front page, you can see that it's something cool they really did. It was a one-time shot in 2003. And they still have it up like, look what we did. Look what we did. And nobody in the community even remembers them. Because we're asking community leaders, tell us about this program. And they said, what program? So the continuity is really important. So first thing is that NGOs sometimes tend to be crisis oriented. And we do need to have crisis intervention. But after the crisis, life goes on. And that's when the real work begins, is the ongoing daily stuff. Um, government likes, the Nicaraguan government likes to see nonprofits come in because they and Haiti vie to be as the second, first and second poorest countries in the Caribbean and Central America. A lot of poverty, in great part created by the embargo that the U.S. government put on Nicaragua in the 1980s and broke the government, um, but that's, that's history. This is what we have to work with now. Lack of trust is a big issue. The people in Middle Floor do not trust the government, generally speaking because they remember, they remember the soldiers running through. This is where the last of the revolutionary battles were held in the 1980s. The Contras and the Sandinistas, they, I, I, when I treat people, I see scars. I talked to a 22-year-old young man who watched his parents being hung in the backyard. The revolution is still in their mind, and they know that the government was involved in it. And, and these people were cooperatives. They, were, they worked in cooperatives. They were what the U.S. government called communists, but they were really cooperatives. And they got caught between the U.S. government and the, the, um, the, uh, and the Civil War in Nicaragua. They didn't want to go to war. They wanted to raise their crops. But they, 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 they don't trust the church because they had, they had some priests and some pastors come down through, find out where the cooperatives were, and then the next thing they knew, the soldiers were coming and burning down their crops. So trust is a huge issue. So there's a history of challenges, whether it be government or NGO. Um, and there's a, there, there is a promise of hope. There's no way that the middle floor of people would let me come back again and again unless they had a sense of hope. And, and only because I've been going back so many times and proved that we are trustworthy. I'm gonna speak about Ashley's question a little bit too. I think some of the same challenges you know, that you see in nonprofits and NGOs anywhere are there as well. And so in terms of with, with the work of the interdisciplinary program, it's to sort of, you know, strengthen, you know, build those connections with the, the nonprofits and NGOs that are sort of around and supporting this kind of work. And so I know that there, you know, so when we were down there at last trip, we had lots of meetings with lots of different kinds of organizations, with universities and NGOs, and to sort of think about, okay, how do we build this connection? Because you don't want to sort of get into the, the point that it, with the scant resources to sort of be drawing off resources, but how do you get into that connection? And then if folks are sort of interested, I'm going to talk for a minute about the Women's Community Collaborative. If folks are interested in sort of thinking about how we do sort of feminist work and combining the theory and practice aspect. The, there's a women's community collaborative internship program through the Women's Center and the, the applications are available now through the Women's Center. Joanne, Joanne can, it's a three credit course and you have an internship placement in a local agency that works with women and girls and so this would be focusing on the, the West Mission aspect but all of those skills you could then 
uh, transfer to work in Nicaragua or other places as well. And so you're working in an agency and then we come together, we meet as a class every two weeks to sort of um, talk about some of those challenges that you're talking about. So how does how does how is working in a nonprofit difficult? How can we sort of how can we sort of be conscientious about sort of applying theory to our work and so combining that theory practice piece. So if folks are interested in that aspect, you can talk to Joanne or you can talk to myself afterwards and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So those skills and, and ideas, but, but challenging to sort of think about how we do that work and how we sort of, I, I think one of the other things that's important for this program is that we want to do the work, there is research out there. So when we're talking about the reading exchange program, it was important to sort of read that research and not try to reinvent the wheel at any point, right? So what have other people done about hand washing programs that has been successful? What have other people done for nutrition programs that has been successful instead of just going in and sort of, okay, you know, sitting down and, and sort of where we're going to start all over again, but sort of take those lessons and think about how they're applicable and how they're not applicable. So, so use the NGOs to what degree that they're useful, but not, like Scala said, not, not let that sort of tie you up. Don't sort of be bound with, okay, well, there's no NGO doing this particular kind of work, so that means that work can't be done. So I keep going back, and Julie is going to keep going back, and some of you are going to go back, because there's something about connecting with people who have similarities to you and who are different from you. There's something about connecting with people from different places that make your eyes bigger. You, c you will be a better citizen here in West Michigan. You will be a better leader back here in West Michigan. You will have a better understanding of what's happening right here in your community if you go someplace else and experience a contrast and look for the similarities in that contrast. That's why I keep going back. And I, I keep going back because I love the, I love the tortillas. <laughs> I can't make them, I've tried. Um, I keep going back because Lucia is one of my really good friends. She's the curandera in the area. She is the memory for herbal medicine. And, and, she, and when I go down, quite often, I, I just jump on a horse and go over the mountain and go see her, depending on where we're located. And she will show me one plant in her garden. She'll let me take a picture of the plant and she'll, write, she'll let me write down the recipe for what it's used. There was an, a plant that she used for anxiety for people. And I looked at it and I thought, oh my goodness, that's the plant that we use, um, oh, oh, I'll think of it in a minute, but I have it growing in my backyard too. It just a little different strain, but she's not going to give me everything. She said I have to come and live with her for a month. If I live with her for a month, she will show me how to plant them and how to make the teas and how to make the concoctions. Um, she's an incredibly intelligent woman. I go back because they draw me back. A piece of my heart is there. And if you go, you're going to find a piece of your heart planted there as well. Questions. What feels confusing about what we've talked about? And I, um, I was just wondering that uh, because of like the government concerns and the cultural concerns and, and the fact that it's such a poor country, have you found a lot of individual resistance against like femini feminist ideas and putting in them into practice day to day? I can talk just briefly in terms of my experience and then Gayla's experience there is, is a little, uh, is much more extensive. So she can talk a little bit about that. But I think perhaps, and, and some of these same resistances are here as well, there's more of a resistance to the feminist label, right? So a lot of the folks that we met with, I don't think would have necessarily called themselves feminists, but certainly what they were doing. So I'm thinking of Julia here. And she's this really strong woman. She, she was one of the, she's a, the teacher that Gail was talking about. And she's a, a strong leader. She has her own coffee cooperative, and it's named after the heroes and martyrs of the revolution. And so she's this really great woman who's, who's in, involved in this kind of work. But I'm not sure that feminist as a label is something that she would claim for herself. And so we could talk about that if you all want, in terms of thinking about the, the usefulness or, or uh, you know, whether or not the, the feminist or feminism label. But, but certainly she's interested, and she's not, she's not about to let anybody tell her what she can do. She dresses how she wants. She sort of, you know, isn't, isn't, she's, working within community norms and regulations, but she's not gonna let that sort of impose upon how she's gonna live her life. Is that you have to think about feminism in a br very broad way though. Well, f fem the, to me, the main purpose of feminism is to make space for voices that usually are not heard. That's the main reason we have feminism around, to give, make equal space 
for equitable space for all voices. Um, and and that, has to be, that has to happen in the context of the woman's life. In, when when um, I was doing this qualitative research to interview the women um, who had worked with the brigades for several years, and we saw the women coming forward more, and so we thought, that we, we, thought we were seeing a sense of empowerment. When we first went, we met only with the men, and the women were not even in sight. And we were down, going down twice a year, one time, three times a year. Um, pretty soon, the women were sort of standing outside the door, because we were getting to know the women. When we were doing our brigades, the women were cooking for us. The women were coming and saying, take that shirt off, I'm gonna wash that, you can't wear that shirt again. And, and they, they, were, they were keeping the latrines clean for us. And so they were understanding our needs. They were assessing us. They were looking at us and saying, what do these gringas need? They're working so hard, how can we work with them? Um, another, another year went by and the women were standing at the door where we were having the pre-planning, the evaluation sessions. And pretty soon the women started sliding in the door and then there was one year that a new person came to cook for us and she had not gone through the kitchen hygiene class that I, I always give. And, and I, I tell them, the Gringas have weak stomachs. We're not accustomed to the bacteria and germs and stuff that are down there. And the water's quite contaminated. Um, and so we, we have weak stomachs. We get sick easily, right? Well, one year, about three quarters of my students got diarrhea. And that was really unusual. I mean, hardly, we hardly ever got sick because they took care of us so much. Um, we went down the next time and I said, you know, we have to talk about this diarrhea problem <laughs> and, and food preparation. And the woman stood up, and, and the men started the talk and said, well, we're going to do this. And this woman stood up and she said, I know why they had the diarrhea, and the women have already talked about it, and they're not going to get sick this time. This man looked at her like, what? And she said, it's taken care of. It's taken care of. Because the women saw the problem and they needed it. So when I started interviewing them, we, we, uh, these, the four other people and I in this research, we said we wanted to ask them, how do you feel now that you've been working with the brigade? Because we thought they felt more empowered. And we're thinking, like you said, individual. And, you know, I can do this. And, and I said, so how do you feel? And they said, well, we've made connections with, with women from other villages. And we said, oh, well, that's really cool. But how do you feel? How have, have you changed at all? Well, you know, you said that when we put food on the plate, we need to have three bright colors, because that means vitamins. So we've been exchanging recipes to get more colors on our plates. We'd say, yes. but." you how does it feel to you for having worked the brigade for so long and finally and it was Julia who said this she said I know what you're saying she said you don't understand what empowerment is in the United States when you think about empowerment you think I can do this I can get ahead she said here in Miraflor when we think about empowerment we think we can do this we can get ahead and nobody steps forward without holding the hands of a person on either side of them. That's empowerment. They think in terms of connectivity, community. They're, they're a very collectivist culture. And we have a lot to learn from them. Because the, we, there's a lot that we gain from being an individualist culture here. There's a lot we've lost. We have so much. They have so much to teach us. You have to get down there so they can teach you. I don't want to take this away from anybody else. But as a, in, in your sense, then what, what have you, the two of you gained? As leaders on this campus, what have you personally gained from these experiences as, and, and learned from all of these opportunities? And I think that, I know we keep saying that all of us should go and I would completely agree, um, but what have you done? It was a really powerful experience. It was both sort of one of the most beautiful places I've ever been, and then some of it was really heart-wrenching. I mean, we're talking about this really intense poverty. So we were having this luncheon meeting with the, some of the, the leaders from Miraflor at this restaurant, and we got up to leave, and these little kids, little street kids, came up and asked for our leftovers. And I've never been any place where a kid, they just wanted whatever little bit was left on the plate. And they, they wouldn't take it, though, unless we said they could, right? It was just leftovers that was going to be thrown away, but they still needed our permission to take these leftovers. So that sort of sense of sort of both the, the sort of empowerment of what was going on in this community, but then also this stark poverty, I think, was a, a really powerful lesson for me to sort of think about putting, putting both of those two things in perspective. And so sort of thinking about then, how do I take those lessons and apply them to what I'm doing? And so for me, this women health and environment class that I teach that I'm really passionate and excited about, I get to sort of apply these lessons in, in the class that's coming up this winter. We're gonna focus a little bit more about globalization. We're gonna talk about globalization and sort of thinking about women and globalization in particular. But so 
those things for me sort of helped me to sort of think about. And then for me, I also, it, it's, it's a thing about research. So how do I sort of connect this to my, my academic life? So part of, part of your life when you're a, a professor or a visiting assistant professor is to sort of think about, I have to be doing this research. I have to sort of be working on these other sort of intellectual projects. So how do I combine that sort of thing that I'm passionate about with the sort of work research aspect? And then so, so Gail and I are, are hopefully uh, eventually going to develop a, a project to work on cervical cancer because cervical cancer is something that is both sort of treatable and preventable and, and sort of with the right resources so to sort of think about how can we apply those skills and talents and resources that we have to sort of address the things that the community sort of has as identified as their priorities so how do we sort of keep building that connection is, is one of the most important things for me and so so yeah it's gotten me really excited about this potential to keep working with these folks we we sort of um, there were some folks up here in October for the Cup of Justice conference which is sort of a fair trade coffee and and to some degree it sort of took over my life you know, in a way that you know that it sort of it, it sort of can do, and so I have to sort of remember there are there are other things I have to be doing as well, but but to sort of find that balance. So, oh, and we need to wind this up because we're running late here. It, how it's changed me. Um, I've always had a strong sense of social justice. I don't know why, but even as a little little girl, something inside me said social justice is a major major issue. Maybe because I was raised in poverty. Maybe, maybe that was because I had an outhouse when I was a kid. But I had a strong sense of social justice. Um, so another way, so, so I, I could see that I could see that we need to connect. I've always been quite involved with the West Michigan or Grand Rapids community. But now, when I'm involved in the community, I'm thinking, how can we connect people in the community for the benefit of this community? How can we connect this community with Nicaragua, with the Middle Florida community in Nicaragua? for the benefit of everybody. How can we instill in people a sense of global citizenship by working together so that we think about borders disappearing and we think about friends? So, and if anything, going to Nicaragua has made me more humble. It's made me learn humility. I came home after the second or third trip and I thought, now why did I think I needed to buy a new car? Why did I think that, you know? I, put, I, I had students come back who, one student came back and said, I can't live the way I was living here after seeing what's there. I'm getting smaller waste baskets for my, my apartment. She had to change her whole life to accommodate those smaller waste baskets because she didn't want to throw so much away anymore because she saw how much we waste. So it, 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 it does change people. It's made me a stronger leader. It's made me more outspoken. It's given me tougher skin. And, and, and that's okay, and it's, it's given me something to focus on. When you look at the world and you see all the needs that are out there, it can feel so overwhelming. You say, you know, I'm out of here. I'm just going to go to the rave party. I'm done. I can't think about this anymore. This has given me something to focus on where I can light a candle someplace with somebody and put our candles together and do something. I know we're running out of time. Just, oh, just quickly in terms of that, that focus thing, one of the things we talked about in my Women Health and Environment class was sort of not letting this stuff become too overwhelming for you. Like it's really easy to sort of say, oh my gosh, there's so much, there's so much poverty and globalization is so overwhelming, but to really sort of focus on that we can make a difference is, is the other thing, the lesson I think to take from this is sort of how, and then so each of us has to figure out what it is that we can make a difference doing what we get passionate about. And so you won't all necessarily get passionate about Nicaragua in the same way that we have, but there's something that you've gotten passionate about. Or, and if you haven't yet, keep looking for that thing and sort of keep doing that work and, and make those, those work connections to, to sort of what you're oh. doing. And I shared hot flashes with Lucia. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want this? <laughs>